Hello, and welcome to my channel, Christine Kersey Books. I'm Christine. The audiobook you are about to listen to is called Dare to Prevail, and it is the fifth and final book in my Parallel World series. One thing to know is before you listen to this, you're going to want to listen to the first three books in the series, Dare to Resist, Dare to Endure, and Dare to Defy. Once you've listened to those, then you'll be ready for this one. It's about the other Morgan when she gets back into her world and her world is kind of turned upside down. So I hope you enjoy the story and let's get started. Dare to Prevail Part 1 Parallel World Book 5 Written and Narrated by Christine Kersey Chapter 1 this has to be a joke, I muttered, as I finished reading the letter for the third time. The lines of neat handwriting blurred as I thought about the boy who had handed me the letter earlier. Billy. That was the name he'd given me when he'd intercepted me at the edge of the forest near my old house in Fox Run. And now I was sitting on the couch in the home of a complete stranger. Was I crazy? Why had I gone with a boy I'd barely met? Enforcers. That's why... When Billy had told me that enforcers were after me, I'd panicked. Who wouldn't? Enforcers were a nightmare, always looking for a reason to harass you, happy to drag you away from all that you knew to lock you up. My own father was locked up in a federally assisted thinning center. When Billy had grabbed me by the arm and told me I had to come with him now, I'd hardly let my mind travel past the thought that enforcers were after me before I'd leapt onto the back of his motorcycle and hung on for dear life as we'd raced away from my old neighborhood. Now, I was in the home of a man named Nick, and Billy was gone. He'd handed me the letter, sat me in the living room, pulled Nick aside, and that was the last I'd seen of him, or anyone. I'd heard Billy's motorcycle revving up, then driving away a short time before, so I knew he'd left. I'd been on my own for the last half hour, and my mind was going in a million directions. I carefully folded the letter into thirds and placed it back in its envelope. Putting aside the bizarre information contained in the letter, I stared at the blank television screen hanging on the wall across from me as I tried to sort out my own peculiar occurrences. I'd been staying at my friend Rochelle Candy's cabin when she and I had argued about some stupid thing or another, and I decided to take a walk by myself. It had been right after breakfast when I'd entered the forest with a bottle of water. I'd been walking for about an hour and had just turned around to head back when dizziness had overcome me and I'd closed my eyes. To my shock, when I'd opened them, the previously dry ground was covered with several inches of snow, and the pleasant morning had become chilled. Confused, I decided I'd better get back to the candy's cabin, and I began walking. Then, even though I thought I was retracing my steps, with my lousy sense of direction, I'd become disoriented and nothing had looked familiar. Afraid I was going to become even more lost, I sat on a log for a while and tried to figure out what had happened— when no good answer came to mind, my only option was to keep trying to find my way back to the candy's cabin. I walked on, but when I recognized an unusual tree that I'd passed a short time before, I realized I was going in circles. Trying a different direction, I strode on. A while later, I had another bout of dizziness. Wondering if I was getting dehydrated, I'd finished my one bottle of water by then, I sat on a boulder and hung my head, then I closed my eyes as I waited for the dizziness to pass. When I felt better, I was stunned to see that the snow had melted, or vanished. I wasn't sure which. All I knew was the snow which had been there moments before was suddenly gone. Astonished, and more than a little perplexed, I stood and continued in the direction I'd been going before the dizzy spell had forced me to stop. Eventually, I saw the backs of houses through the trees, and I headed toward those. To my complete and utter surprise, I recognized my old house in Fox Run. Mystified as to how I'd gotten back to my old neighborhood, because my family and I lived in Timber Hills, and the Candy's cabin was at least 45 minutes away from Fox Run, I stumbled out of the forest and toward the backs of the houses. That's when I ran into Billy. 
I'd never seen him before that moment, but when he looked at me, recognition lit his eyes. Even so, his mouth hung open in apparent shock. Morgan? he asked. I wondered how this complete stranger knew my name, but since I was trying to comprehend how I'd ended up in Fox Run, I pushed aside any new questions. Instead, I nodded. He grabbed my arm, and with an urgency that pierced me, he said, You have to come with me, right now. I balked at going anywhere with him, even taking a step back toward the forest, but that's when he told me that enforcers were hunting me. Hunting. That was the word he used. Not searching or looking, but hunting, like I was some sort of prey. Enforcers? I asked. I wanted to ask why they were after me, since I'd always been careful to follow the rules. It's true that sometimes I forgot to weigh myself, but Mom had always gotten a text when that happened, and then she would remind me to get on the scale. I'd even gotten a waiver for the few days I would be at Rochelle's cabin. Maybe they'd rejected it, and I didn't know. Maybe they were going to take me to a fat center for punishment, just like they'd taken Dad. Panic exploded within me, and I said, Okay. Over here, Billy said. Then he rushed to a motorcycle parked near my old house. Heart slamming against my ribs, I swiftly followed him, and after a brief glance at my old house, I put on the helmet he handed me, then climbed on behind him. When we reached the house I sat in now, Billy climbed off the motorcycle, then helped me off. As I handed him my helmet, alarm bells rang in my mind. I didn't know where I was or what was happening. Come with me, Billy said. I stepped back. Where am I? What's going on? Why did you bring me here? He reached into his pocket and pulled out the letter, then held it out to me. This will explain everything. Confused, but curious, I'd taken the letter and followed him into the house. He'd left me in the living room, and I'd read the letter. Now, still having trouble processing the message and grasping who'd written it, I slid it out of the envelope, unfolded the sheets of paper, and began reading it again. Dear Morgan, that sounds so strange because I'm Morgan. It feels like I'm writing this letter to myself. In a way, I guess I am. I hardly know where to begin, but I know you must have a ton of questions. Let me start by saying how sorry I am that I screwed up your life. Honestly, it wasn't on purpose, and I hope you'll be able to forgive me. But at a minimum, I think what I've experienced may help change the way things are in your world. I continued reading the letter from this person who claimed to be a version of me from a parallel world. She explained how she'd stumbled into my world, gotten herself locked up in a fat center, made enemies in high places, escaped their grasp, and was now going to attempt to go back to her world. Evidently she'd made it, because I was here and she was nowhere to be found, which meant I would have to clean up the mess she'd made of my life. I wanted to wad up her letter and throw it across the room, but there was information in that letter that I might need, so I folded it and tucked it into the envelope. Do you have any questions? Nick asked as he walked into the room. Did I have any questions? Like, what was a parallel world? Had I actually been in one? My mind whirled as I desperately tried to digest the information in the letter, information that seemed too incredible to be true, but it also perfectly explained what I'd experienced. I don't have all the answers, Nick said, as he sat in a chair next to the couch. Then he laughed. I just barely learned about this parallel world business myself. Tearing my eyes away from the envelope where I'd placed the letter, I shifted my attention to him. He just learned about it? What do you mean? I asked. I mean, this morning, Billy and Morgan... He laughed. Not you, but... He shook his head. Anyway, they left this morning, and then Billy came back with you. He told me a crazy story about a parallel world, which I never would have believed... His mouth turned up into a half-smile. Except here you are. Here I am? I asked. I still didn't know what he meant. Yes, you're not the same girl named Morgan that I spent time with over the last few days. Maybe I was the same girl, I thought. Maybe I just had amnesia and couldn't remember writing the letter. Oddly, the idea that I'd completely lost my memory brightened my mood 
as if that was a better alternative than what the letter told me. How can you be sure I'm not the same girl? I asked. For one thing, she had short hair, and it was dark. Morgan requested that a friend of mine color it back to her natural color. I touched my long hair, then tucked a loose strand behind my ear. It felt strange to hear him talk about this other world version of me so casually, like she actually existed. Besides, he continued, there was something about her, a confidence, like she'd figured things out. He shook his head. No offense, but you're not her. Chapter 2 The admiration in Nick's voice for this other girl was obvious, but rather than feeling envious or inadequate, it made me think I could be like her. After all, wasn't she just a different version of me? Why couldn't I be like that, confident and sure of myself? Because I wasn't, that's why. I frightened easily. How else to explain how Billy, a boy I'd never met, had been able to effortlessly convince me to go with him. Of course, my willingness to go somewhere with a stranger should have frightened me too, and it did, but my fear of the enforcers was ingrained from childhood. They scared me even more. Can I see my family? I asked. The letter had explained that they were in a safe place, but I needed to see for myself that they were okay, that Dad was out of the fat center. Of course, he smiled. Billy told me about the letter Morgan wrote to you. It explained what's going on? Torn between believing what the letter said and believing that this was all a massive joke some unknown person was playing on me, I didn't answer right away. I had no idea why someone would play a joke like this on me, or who would think of such an elaborate prank, but I had to admit, if it was indeed a hoax, it was the most clever one I'd heard of. Whoever wrote this, I said with a smile as I held up the envelope, is very imaginative. Maybe if I called him out on it, Nick would laugh and admit that, yes, this was just an elaborate stunt that some new reality show had put together to see how gullible teenage girls could be. I knew I was a good target for that, and I suddenly wondered if they'd picked me ahead of time or if I was a random target. I could see it now, some producer telling his team that they would walk up to an unsuspecting girl and tell her that the enforcers were after her, then they would bring her to this house, hand her a letter telling her that another world's version of her had been here and screwed up her life, then see what she would do about it. But Nick didn't laugh at my comment, and he didn't say anything about this being fake. He just stared at me like he was trying to figure me out. Yes, I finally said, the smile gone from my face. I read the letter. Good, because there are a few things we need to talk about before I bring you to your family. Okay. What else could I say? I wanted to wake up and be back at the Candy's cabin. The Candy's, I thought. I need to let my friend know where I am. I was staying at her cabin, and her family's probably wondering where I went. Do you have a phone I can use? Nick smiled. I don't think they're wondering where you are. He gestured to the letter in my hand. It's been two months since you were at your friend's cabin. Billy explained everything to me. A jolt of unreality pulsed through me. Two months, I said. How is that possible? What's the date? Today is November 10th. He said it as if he hadn't just announced something earth-shattering. My world tilted on its axis. But that's impossible. It's September 2nd. I'm supposed to start at my new school in a couple of days. I shook my head. He had to be wrong. You must be mistaken. He pulled out his cell phone, tapped the screen, then held it out to me. There it was, in a brightly backlit screen. Today's date, November 10th. I sank back against the couch. The letter had failed to mention the shift in time, and that I'd been in a parallel world for only a few hours, while this other girl had been impersonating me in my world for two months. Morgan, Nick said in a gentle voice, there's more we need to talk about. Still reeling from the news that I'd missed two months of my life while a complete stranger had made a mess of things, I tried to focus on Nick. In the letter, he said, did she talk about the thing she experienced in the fat center? There's not a lot of detail, I said. I guess she didn't have time to write it all down. He chuckled. I guess she knew I would have the video to show you. Video? That sounded intriguing. A video of the girl who claimed to be me? 
What video? When Morgan went back to Camp Willamas to help her sister, well, your sister, she wore glasses that had the ability to record what was going on. Nick shifted in his seat like he suddenly felt uncomfortable. She only recorded the time she thought would have the biggest impact on people, to get people to realize that they should be less complacent about what goes on in the fat centers. He paused. Do you have any idea what it's like in the fat centers? Of course I didn't, I thought. I'd always followed the rules so I wouldn't have to go to one of those places. No, not really. He picked up a remote beside his chair, then looked at me. In that case, some of this might be a bit disturbing. Foreboding washed over me. Somehow I knew that what I was about to see could have happened to me. Perhaps still could happen. Okay. Are you ready? No, I thought. I guess so. He pressed a button and the screen came to life. The face of a woman I'd never seen before filled the screen. Where was the girl? I wanted to see her. Then I realized that she was the one wearing the camera, so I wouldn't be able to see her. Disappointment grew within me, but I pushed it aside as I focused on what was playing out in front of me. The woman was harassing the girl about her weight. I couldn't bring myself to call her Morgan, and though I couldn't see the girl's face, I could hear her voice. I had to admit that her voice sounded very familiar, kind of like mine. That video clip ended and the next one began. The image bounced like the girl was running and I could see exercise equipment in the picture. A man came into view. He made a rude comment about the girl needing to lose weight. Next, I saw my sister Amy running on a treadmill. Even though the letter the girl had written had said Amy was put in a federally assisted thinning center, it was still shocking to see her there. Then I remembered that Amy was only there because of what the girl had done. Anger at this unknown girl swept over me. Who did she think she was that she could come out of nowhere and put my sister in that position? My thoughts were interrupted by the words I heard the man say to Amy. It was the same man who'd been rude to the girl in the last clip. You think you're so cool, the man taunted Amy, because your sister is the famous Morgan Campbell. Well, I knew your sister, and she was as much of a loser as you are. In fact, I'm not sure who is more of a loser, you or her. The famous Morgan Campbell, I thought. What was that all about? I focused on Amy, and it seemed like she was ignoring the man's taunts, until he turned up the speed on the treadmill. I gasped as she lost her footing, but she caught herself before she fell. The man continued to torment her, asking her what she thought of her sister. Me. I was her sister, not some girl from another world. Amy ignored him, then without warning, she placed her feet on the sides of the treadmill and shouted, I hate her! I hate her! I hate her! My baby sister hated me? The thought made me sick. Even though Amy and I weren't super close, we'd always gotten along. Knowing she felt that way about me made my heart hurt. The man grinned at Amy's words. Then he stated that he hated me too. How could all these people hate me? I hadn't done anything. I hate you too, Amy said to the man. My eyes widened. Somehow I knew that was going to be met with punishment. If the man wasn't an actual enforcer, he was probably the closest thing to one at the fat center, and that could only mean trouble for Amy. My assumption was verified when I saw the man gesture with his head to someone out of view and a uniformed enforcer walked into the picture. Oh no, I whispered, as my heart raced in fear. What was that enforcer going to do to Amy? The enforcer had a baton in his hand, and he whacked it against his open palm as he stood next to Amy. He scolded her for the way she'd spoken to the first man, then he told her to apologize. Amy looked terrified as her eyes went from the enforcer to the first man. Then she looked directly at the camera, directly at me. I wanted to reach out and help her, but I was helpless to do anything. "'Look at me when I'm talking to you,' the enforcer said. Then he smacked the back of her leg with his baton. Amy obviously hadn't expected the blow, because the leg that the enforcer hit collapsed beneath her and she almost fell onto the moving belt but she managed to grip the arms of the treadmill to keep from falling. Crying, she pulled herself back up, then she grabbed her injured leg with one hand as she set her foot on the side of the treadmill to avoid the moving belt. Disgust churned within me. 
How could they treat people like that? Then I realized that I had no idea how they treated people in the fat centers. Had Dad experienced the same thing? I focused on the screen and saw the enforcer telling Amy to apologize. Sobbing, she did. He told her to run for 20 minutes, then he and the other man walked away. Do you want to stop? Nick asked. Startled, I looked at him. I'd been so caught up in the video that I'd forgotten he was there. Does it get worse? I asked. He stared at me, then he slowly nodded. I'm afraid so. Chapter 3 Did I want to see more? No, I didn't. You have to remember, Nick said. There are only three people who know you're not her. He pointed to the pause screen. You, me, and Billy. That's it. A sad smile curved his mouth. And Billy is gone. But he's coming back, right? No. Nick shook his head. No. He told me he's going to attempt to cross into the other world. To be with Morgan. What? I thought. He knows how? I asked. I believe so. How? How do you do it? Maybe I could do it too, I thought. Nick frowned. He refused to tell me. My shoulders slumped. I felt very alone. My point is that the things that happened to Morgan... He sighed. Everyone will assume they happened to you. He paused, evidently waiting for me to catch up to his point. And then I did. You're saying that I have to watch that video, probably multiple times. Don't you want to know what Amy is talking about when she recounts the things you've seen? Or when other people ask you about your time in the fat centers? Don't you want to be able to speak as if you actually experienced what Morgan did? Fresh anger ignited inside me. My life had been going along just fine until that girl appeared and totally screwed everything up. It's not ideal, Nick said, but what other choice do you have? I could tell the truth. He stared at me. What do you think will happen if you tell people it wasn't really you, but some other girl who has your exact DNA, a girl from a parallel world? I thought about the enforcer who had hit Amy on the leg with his baton. I wouldn't want him or any other enforcer after me. And after that girl had escaped from them not once but twice, I doubted they would accept my story and let me off the hook. That enforcer who hit Amy? Nick said, evidently reading my mind. Yeah? I'd seen the terror in Amy's eyes when he'd approached her. I wanted nothing to do with him. Morgan told me his name is Hanson. She said he has a special hatred for her. His face was grim. Which means you. The letter had mentioned a man named Hanson several times. He was someone the girl had feared, which meant I should fear him. Could this get any worse? I'm sorry, Morgan. I couldn't think about my world anymore. It was a nightmare. What is her world like? I asked. Nick looked thoughtful. All I know is what Billy told me, and all he knows is what Morgan told him. He chuckled. Although I suspect he'll be experiencing her world for himself very soon. What did he tell you? Looking wistful, Nick said. In her world, it's not illegal to be overweight. I found that hard to believe, but what if it was true? What would it be like to live in a world like that? What would happen if I crossed over? But how would I do it? Frustration at my utter helplessness flowed over me, and I bristled again at the position that girl had put me in. Are you ready to continue watching the video, Morgan? I didn't see that I had a choice, so I said, Yeah, okay. Nick pressed the play button. A room crowded with tables filled the screen. A cafeteria. Off camera, a male voice asked, Why are you sitting with this table full of rejects? Are you a reject too? He laughed. You're here, so I guess you are a reject. He paused. Who's your roommate? When the girl didn't answer, the camera jerked violently, like he'd shoved the girl. Then he said, Look at me and answer my question. Hansen's face came into view, and the girl said her roommate was Lori. After a few moments, the camera panned to a table a short distance away where Hansen was talking to a girl. I assumed it was Lori. Hanson walked away from Lori, and Lori glared at the camera. I'm so sorry, Hannah, Amy said, and the camera focused on my sister. For a moment, I was confused why Amy was calling the girl Hannah, until I remembered the letter explaining how the girl had impersonated someone else so that she could help Amy. 
She'd impersonated someone else while impersonating me. Could this get any crazier? That video clip ended, and the next one began. I've collected some power bars now, just so you know, the girl said into the camera. My mouth fell open as I watched her. She looked so much like me. Then she pointed the camera at a small pile of power bar chunks. The clip ended. Wait, I said to Nick. He paused the video. Can you go back? I had to see the girl's face again. Even though her hair was cut short and dyed a dark color, I recognized her. He did as I asked, and when her face came into view, I asked him to pause the video. I stared at her as my mind frantically tried to work out what I was seeing. I had a sense of deja vu, except that I'd never experienced what she did. Seeing her face like that, feeling like it was somehow me I was watching, I felt an unexpected kinship with a girl from another world. Morgan. I formed her name in my head, disassociating the label from myself. Duplicate Morgan. That's how I would think of her. Why was she collecting power bars? I asked. We have them at school all the time. The ones at Camp Willamos are different than the ones you've had. He pointed to the paused image on the screen. Those ones have an addictive drug in them, as well as a drug that controls behavior. He frowned. They were testing them on the kids in the fat center. Oh. As controlling as the government was, this information still shocked me. How do you know there are drugs in them? We'd heard rumors, and when Billy first joined our group, he confirmed our suspicions. Morgan was collecting samples for another resistance group. This was a lot to take in. First to learn I'd been in another world for a few hours, then to discover duplicate Morgan had been here for the last two months, pretending to be me, and now to find out that the government was drugging kids. Are you ready to continue? Nick asked. There was no doubt I would have to watch this video multiple times as I processed all that I was learning. All right. He pressed play and a new clip began. The woman who'd been in the first clip, Mrs. Reynolds, appeared on the screen. It looked like she was in the classroom with chairs arranged in a circle. Why are you here, Hannah? She asked, clearly unhappy. Duplicate Morgan said she didn't know, and after Mrs. Reynolds asked the rest of the group some questions, she turned her attention to Lori, Duplicate Morgan's roommate. The woman coerced Lori into telling everyone why she was at Camp Willamos, and after an extended back and forth between Lori and Mrs. Reynolds, it came out that Lori had falsified Duplicate Morgan's weight history to show a pattern of weight gain. Or was it my weight history? And because of the false information, Duplicate Morgan had been sent to Camp Willamos. Stunned to learn that the girl Lori, whom I'd never met, had been the one behind the mess I now found myself in, a slow burn of hate flickered to life inside me. Why had she done that? The anger I'd been feeling toward Duplicate Morgan, DM for short, faded. If it wasn't for Lori, DM would never have been put in the fat center. A sudden commotion on the screen grabbed my attention. Amy had jumped up and was facing Lori. You lied, Amy screamed. You lied about my sister, and now I'm here, all because of you. Then Amy did the most unexpected thing. She lunged at Lori and knocked her over. They fell on the floor with Amy on top, both of them screaming. Seconds later, a pair of enforcers grabbed the girls and pulled them apart. I'd never seen my sister so angry before. Never. Mrs. Reynolds' voice filled the room. Amy, I understand why you're upset, but what Lori did doesn't change anything for you. You're still here in your sister's place because she stabbed one of our enforcers, which is completely unacceptable. Hanson, I thought. That's who DM stabbed. A small smile lifted the corners of my mouth. From what I'd seen of him so far, he most likely deserved it. The next part of the video began with an enforcer telling DM to sit in a chair in front of a table. After placing two straps around her chest, a blood pressure cuff on her arm, and two small clips on her fingers, the polygraph test began. I remembered reading in her letter about this, how her true identity had been discovered, but witnessing the experience for myself was much more frightening, especially after all the video I'd seen which had led up to this, and especially when I knew what was going to happen. Mrs. Reynolds asked DM several questions which she answered calmly, 
but when Mrs. Reynolds asked her final question, my body tensed as if I was the one being asked. "'Is your name really Morgan Campbell?' Mrs. Reynolds asked. The room erupted in chatter, but after shutting everyone up, she asked the question again. I expected to hear D.M. deny it, but instead Amy leapt from her chair and shouted, "'No! She's Hannah! Hannah Jacobs!' Love for my little sister blossomed inside me. D.M. had alluded to Amy's loyalty and fierce defense, but seeing it for myself, particularly when I knew how severe the consequences of speaking out could be, amazed me. The video went on with Mrs. Reynolds stating that she had DNA evidence that D.M. was not Hannah Jacobs at all, but that she was Morgan Campbell. Again, the unreality of D.M. having the same DNA as me blew my mind. As the enforcers approached D.M., Amy once again showed her sweet devotion as she flung herself against her older sister. "'I won't let them take you, Morgan,' Amy cried out. "'I won't!' "'It will be okay, Amy,' D.M. murmured, although I was certain she knew that was a lie. One of the enforcers forcibly pulled Amy away and shoved her toward the rest of the kids who watched in morbid fascination. "'You'll let my sister go now, right?' D.M. asked." Mrs. Reynolds said that they would release Amy the next morning, at the same time that D.M. would be transferred to a more secure facility. A few minutes later, the enforcers moved D.M. to another room, a room that she couldn't get out of based on her attempt to open the locked door. The camera panned the small space as if D.M. was turning in a slow circle. The room was a jail cell, concrete walls, a cot bolted to the floor, a metal sink attached to the wall, and a metal toilet in the corner. D.M.'s voice floated into the space, a voice filled with despair. If you can hear me, please come and get me right away. Hopelessness swelled inside me, and I was so caught up in the moment that when Nick paused the video, I blinked, unsure for a moment where I was. I glanced around the living room, and when I realized I wasn't the one locked in a cell, relief flooded me. Chapter 4 Let's take a short break, Nick said. Yeah, okay. Nick offered to get me something to drink, which I readily accepted, and after ten minutes of replaying the scenes in my head, I turned to Nick with a frown. Why did Lori lie about Morgan's weight? How did she even know her? Lori went to Morgan's school. Your school. I was supposed to start at a new school in two days. Yes, well, that's where Lori went as well. Evidently, the two girls didn't get along, and this was Lori's way of getting back at Morgan for something or another. That's so wrong. He smiled. Nothing about the fat centers are right, you realize. I'm beginning to. I paused as I remembered D.M.'s voice filling the room at the end of the last clip. Who was Morgan talking to when she was in that cell? The people she was working with, the ones who gave her the camera. Evidently, they told her the camera might be able to access the Wi-Fi in Camp Willamos and upload the video. She told me she was hoping they would hear it and come rescue her. He frowned. I don't think they heard it, but even if they did, there wasn't much anyone could have done for her at that point. A sensation of sisterhood with DM came over me. It was almost like a part of me had gone through what she had and my throat ached. I was so glad it hadn't actually been me in there. Before we continue, I want to show you the news conference that took place after Morgan was taken out of that cell. Morgan didn't take any video, so this is all from the perspective of the media. A moment later, I saw D.M. being escorted into a large space. Fascinated by her appearance, she looked so much like me, although different too. She was a bit heavier than me, which rounded out her face, and her hair was darker and shorter than mine, and she wore glasses. But still, I recognized her. There were shouts of, Morgan, coming from the reporters, but then a voice I recognized shouted my, her, name. The camera swung to the left, and I saw Mom, Dad, and Amy. They looked so distraught as they called out to DM. The camera focused back on DM as a pair of enforcers, enforcers I hadn't seen before, walked DM to a chair, then after pushing her to sit in it, they cuffed her legs to the chair. Then a man strode up to a podium and began talking. He seemed quite pleased with himself and the fact that he had D.M. in custody. He explained how they caught her and then announced that she would be transferred to Camp Stonewater, 
a facility with higher security. Can I at least tell my family goodbye? D.M. called out, and the man, Tasco, agreed. I watched as D.M., with the enforcers right behind her, went to my parents and my sister. With her hands bound behind her back, she wasn't able to return their hugs, but as I watched their reunion, tears filled my eyes. A short time later, the enforcers escorted D.M. to a waiting vehicle, and a moment after that, she was gone. "'Are you ready to watch the rest?' Nick asked. "'The part where Morgan's in Camp Stonewater?' "'Sure,' I said. "'I guess.' To get you up to speed, Morgan told me that when she first arrived at Camp Stonewater, the people there fed her several of the drug-laced power bars. Then a woman named Holly, who you'll see in a minute, and a man named Fred questioned her about their resistance group she had been working with. Fortunately, she didn't tell them all that much, and they brought her to her room and let her sleep off the drugs. That's where this video picks up. I nodded, angry at Holly and Fred on duplicate Morgan's behalf. Nick started the video. A woman walked into what looked like a bedroom, then she sat on a bed across from D.M. I assumed the woman was Holly. She asked D.M. how she was feeling and told her that they needed her to help them. D.M. laughed at the suggestion, and I smiled. Why would she want to help them? Then Holly said something that grabbed my attention. Morgan, you seem to think this is all just a game, but you have to understand that the people in charge are deadly serious. She leaned forward and stared steadily at D.M. Deadly! Duplicate Morgan's laughter stopped abruptly. What do you mean? Holly sat back and looked more relaxed. I mean, between you and me, they'll do whatever it takes to keep the status quo. They're well aware of the resistance groups out there that want to change the way the government has chosen to run things. To control things, one might say. And they want to stop those groups. Those groups represent an annoyance that they just don't want to have to deal with anymore. She paused. They've had enough, Morgan. They want to put a stop to these groups once and for all. I glanced at Nick and saw that he was watching the screen intently. Holly told D.M. that unlike Camp Willowmoss, she would have no freedom at Camp Stonewater unless she cooperated. Then she told D.M. to take some time to think it over. In the next part... Holly came back into the room and asked D.M. for her decision. D.M. flatly said no. Pride for my clone pounded through me, but fear was close behind. What would they do to her? In moments, Holly returned, but she wasn't alone. A pair of enforcers and a woman in a lab coat were with her. D.M. obviously tried to run past the group, but one of the enforcers easily stopped her. Remember, Holly said calmly, you wanted this. My heart raced as I waited to see what would happen. Seconds later, D.M. collapsed to the ground. From the vantage point of the camera, I couldn't tell what was happening, but after a moment, Holly said, You'll be fine, Morgan. Tendrils of fear slithered up my spine at the tone of her voice, and I knew something awful was in store. The clip ended, and I turned to Nick. What did they do to her? His expression was grim. They inserted a device into the base of her skull. A device? What do you mean? What did it do? His expression darkened. You'll see in a minute. I didn't want to see. I didn't want to see anything at all. I wanted to return to my normal, quiet, boring life. Not in the home of a resistance leader who was showing me the horrific things that had happened to Duplicate Morgan, which everyone would believe had happened to me. Despite my reluctance to witness whatever was about to happen... The video played on. Holly entered the room. Knowing that she had orchestrated the insertion of some device into the base of Duplicate Morgan's skull, I recoiled at the sight of her. I could only imagine how D.M. felt. Holly asked her if she'd made a wise decision, and D.M. said she would prefer to stay in her room. Admiration for another world's version of me swept over me, and I suddenly had a great desire to get to know her. Then I realized that I could be her. She was me, after all. We shared the same DNA. Why couldn't I be as brave and strong as she was? Holly was obviously unhappy with GM's answer, and after leaving, she returned with the same two enforcers that had been there for every other Camp Stonewater video. Both men were tall and muscular, and I didn't think I would ever forget their impassive faces. They approached DM, bound her hands, 
escorted her out of her room and into what looked like an interrogation room, then left her there. Morgan was left alone for quite a while, Nick said. My technical people cut out the section of the video where Morgan waited. I nodded, then watched as Holly and a man I hadn't seen before came into the room with one of the enforcers behind him. That man is Fred, Nick said. Holly set a small case on the table, then she and Fred sat across from D.M. while the enforcer stood against a wall. Fred began asking D.M. questions, but she didn't respond. Fred sighed, then looked at Holly and nodded once. Holly picked up the small device that she'd placed in front of her and tapped the screen. D.M. screamed like she was in excruciating pain. I cried out as well, horrified to know that they were torturing her. My heart hammered against my ribs, and adrenaline pounded through my veins. I wanted to reach out and help D.M. somehow, but that was impossible. The camera went to a crazy angle, as if D.M. had slid out of her chair and her glasses had fallen off. A moment later, she stopped screaming. A pair of large hands came into the frame as someone, I assumed the enforcer, placed duplicate Morgan's glasses back on her face. My heart still thundered, and I silently prayed that this was almost over. But it wasn't. Fred continued to batter DM with questions, and Holly pressed the button on her device two more times. If it had been me, I would have been spilling my guts like nobody's business, but to duplicate Morgan's credit, she resisted. She told them a few things, but it didn't seem like critical information. Finally, Fred and Holly left DM alone. My shoulders slumped in relief. Then Holly came back. I tensed, waiting to see what the evil woman would do. You did okay, Morgan, Holly said as she sat across from DM. We still need your help, though. She smiled. Tomorrow you're going on a little field trip. You're going to help us find Bren. Her smile grew. I know you'll be eager to cooperate. We'll leave first thing in the morning, so make sure you're ready. The enforcer... Holly called him Mills, undid duplicate Morgan's hands. Then Holly walked DM to her room, told her to be ready in the morning, and left. Then I saw duplicate Morgan's face as she stared at herself in the mirror. Her face was pale and streaked with tears. I'm so sorry I wasn't stronger, she murmured. The screen went blank. Chapter 5 Nick turned off the TV. That's the end of it. How did she escape? I asked. The letter didn't say. He told me how D.M. had been at a high school with Holly and an enforcer looking for the girl named Bryn and how D.M. had managed to snatch the torture device out of Holly's hand before running away. Someone from my team, he began. That is, the enforcer who caught Morgan after she got away from Holly. He's actually on my team. When he caught up to Morgan, she put up quite a fight, and he had to sedate her before bringing her here. Having trouble processing everything, I nodded. Then I thought about the girl they'd been after at the school. What about Bryn? Thankfully, they didn't catch her. He studied me. How are you feeling? Rattled, I thought. Overwhelmed. Terrified I would be captured and tortured. I'd like to be alone for a while. I understand. He stood and left the room. I stared at the screen where I'd witnessed the most horrific things I'd ever seen in my life. Though I'd always had a vague idea of what happened to those who went to federally assisted thinning centers, I'd never really understood what truly went on in the buildings I'd driven past any number of times. Even when my own father was taken to a fat center, I'd imagined him going to a place where people would help him learn better eating and exercise habits not be terrorized by the people who were supposed to help him. Dad, I thought. The idea of him suffering like DM made me sick. I wanted to be with him and the rest of my family. But first, I had to come to terms with my reality. Nick had told me that this video was on the internet, and that it had been viewed by tens of thousands of people, and that the number of views was growing rapidly. Every single person who viewed that video would think it was me that had recorded it, me who had been tortured, me who had escaped the fat centers. The people viewing the video included my enemies, people I'd never met, but people who hated me, people like Hanson and Holly, 
people who were certain to be furious that I'd managed to escape them not once, but twice. People I feared now with every fiber of my being. I imagined meeting those people face to face, and my body began to tremble. Coldness seeped into my bones, and a sheen of sweat coated my skin. They would taser me, insert the torture device into the base of my skull, and then Holly would press the button that would send me into throes of agony, and she would enjoy it. It would be like retribution against DM for getting away from her. My stomach clenched and I raced to the bathroom, but I managed to hold down the contents of my stomach. I stared at my reflection in the mirror. Haunted eyes and a pale face stared back. Fresh anger at DM tore through me. I wanted to throttle her, but since that was an impossibility, I stewed in my fury instead, momentarily hoping that she was suffering back in her world. Even as those thoughts came to mind, I couldn't help but admire her bravery in going back into Camp Willemas to help Amy. She put herself in peril to help my sister. Yes, Amy was in Camp Willemas because of DM, but she didn't have to go back inside. She could have left Amy there and simply gone back to her own world. Yet she hadn't. If she'd known what was going to happen, would she have made the same decision? Somehow I thought she would. She seemed like that kind of person. What would I have done? Ashamed to admit that I might have been afraid to go back inside, even to help my own sister, I looked away from my reflection and stared at the white sink. All my life, I'd been careful to follow the rules set up by society. Though I occasionally forgot to weigh myself, when Mom would receive a text telling her that my weight was overdue, I would immediately jump onto the government-provided scale align the retinal scanner with my eyes, and stand still until the machine stated my weight. I'd never wanted the enforcers to take notice of me, and now I was certain I was their number one target, all because of DM. Rage sparked inside me, and I lifted my eyes to stare at myself again. Morgan? Nick called from the other side of the bathroom door. Yeah? We need to talk some more. What else was he going to tell me? And could I take it? I'll be out in a minute. I'll be in the living room. His footsteps faded away. I turned on the faucet and splashed cool water on my face, attempting to wash away all the emotions swirling inside me. It didn't work. Patting my face dry with a soft green towel, my fear and anger only grew. Of all the people who had to come from another world, why did it have to be my clone? And why did she have to make such a mess of my life? Logically, I knew it wasn't completely her fault. Lori had admitted that she'd lied about Duplicate Morgan's weight in order to get her thrown into the fat center. But did DM have to make such an effort to grow her list of enemies? People who were now my enemies? No, she could have laid low, stayed under the radar, my preferred method of operation, and finished her time in Camp Willemos. Her letter had said something about dates being important when it came time to get home, so I kind of understood why she couldn't wait around in Camp Willemos. But still, did she have to make such a spectacular escape? One where she stabbed an enforcer? An enforcer? The very people I feared the most? Sighing loudly, I finished in the bathroom, then went to see what other bad news Nick had for me. Chapter 6 when I entered the living room, I saw that Nick had set out a plate of sandwiches along with fresh fruit and glasses of ice water. Are you hungry? he asked with a kind smile. I shrugged. A little, I guess. Good. He gestured to the food. Please help yourself. I picked up the glass of water and took a sip. What did you need to talk to me about? I asked. I wanted to get this over with. I wanted to see my family. You may have noticed that Morgan's hair is shorter and darker than yours. An image of duplicate Morgan being escorted by a pair of enforcers at the news conference came to mind. Yes, her hair looked very different from mine. Then the point of his comment hit me. Nick wanted me to cut my hair. My hands sprang to my hair and I slid my fingers through the long strands. I loved my long hair. It was my best feature. I really, really didn't want to cut it. Nick held up a pair of scissors. I'm sorry, Morgan. Frantically thinking of an excuse to keep it long, I said, 
but if the enforcers think I have short dark hair, wouldn't it be better to keep it like this? Maybe they won't recognize me. How will you explain to your family how your hair suddenly grew? Hair extensions? He laughed. If your hair is long, you'll be inviting some very uncomfortable questions. He smiled. Besides, you can always grow it again, right? Clearly, he'd never try to grow his hair out. It had taken me years to get it this long. I'll think about it, I said. That was all I was willing to commit to. His smile dimmed. I'm afraid you won't be able to see your family until you cut it. What? Why not? Look, Morgan, maybe you don't realize how serious things have gotten, but we have to be smart about how we proceed. With a video going viral, you're in the midst of becoming very well known, and not just by the enforcers. I hadn't considered that. I'd heard of people becoming famous because of something they'd posted online, but I'd been too focused on processing what I'd seen to think beyond my immediate concerns. What you're saying is, I said, not only do I need to know what happened to that girl while she was pretending to be me, but I need to look just like her? He nodded. That seemed counterintuitive to me. Won't that make it easier for the enforcers to find me? I asked. That was my primary concern. He set the scissors on the coffee table, then he looked at me. You need to be recognizable. Recognizable, I thought. He might as well paint a giant bullseye on my back. I set my glass on the coffee table. My hand was trembling. I don't want them to catch me. No, of course not. We'll keep you well hidden, and this house is very secure. He smiled. I have a state-of-the-art alarm system. I didn't understand. Then what's the point of me being recognizable? Public opinion is on the verge of changing, to realizing that things have gotten out of control. The video Morgan made has been key to unlocking the mind of the public, but to reach the tipping point, we need something more. More? I asked. Like what? I hoped he wasn't suggesting that I go into a fat center. I would be more likely to shave my head than go into a fat center and face what DM had faced. What we have in mind, Nick said is to create several more videos that we'll upload as a kind of extension to what Morgan created. What does that have to do with me? You'll be the one in the videos, of course. Which was why I needed to look like DM, I realized. The video you watched is exactly what the public is seeing, but there's no context to go with it, no narrative of what Morgan actually felt or experienced, or what led to each incident, no story to tie everything together. He picked up an empty plate, set a sandwich on it along with several slices of fresh fruit, then leaned back in his chair. The food on his plate made my stomach churn. Or maybe it was the thought of pretending to be someone else. How can I tell the story of what happened when I didn't actually experience it? I asked. What did Morgan tell you in her letter? Did she give you many details of her time in Camp Willamas and Camp Stonewater? I glanced at the envelope sitting on the coffee table. She told me about a lot of things that happened. You can read it if you want. Okay, good. He ate some cantaloupe. What I want to do is interview you. You would be the only one on camera, but I would ask you questions, and then you would answer them based on the information Morgan told you in the letter. That didn't sound too awful. Okay. We'll keep the interviews brief. That should keep people coming back for more so that they can find out what happens next. When do you want to do this? As soon as you're ready. He glanced at the scissors. You'll need to cut your hair, although you can leave the color alone. And you'll need to study the letter so that you can give authentic answers. Authentic answers? I thought. What would happen if they were inauthentic? He must have sensed my worry. We'll practice each interview before we actually film it, okay? I nodded. His proposal didn't sound quite as daunting as I'd first thought it would be, and as my confidence grew, my stomach rumbled with hunger. I selected a sandwich, placed several pieces of fruit on my plate, and began eating. I want to tell you one other thing, Nick said. Okay. The enforcer you saw in the video? Mills? Yes. He works for me, for the resistance. That was unexpected, and I wondered why he was telling me. Mills is the one who chased Morgan down after she escaped from Holly. He paused. I'm only telling you about Mills because you may see him around here, and I didn't want you to be frightened of him. 
I pictured the man I'd seen in several of the videos. He was large and imposing. I was glad to know he was on our side. When you're done eating, will you cut your hair? The inevitability of my hair being cut short settled over me. It would be useless to fight it. I sighed. I guess so. Nick smiled. Good. Chunks of hair puddled around my feet, and as I wielded the scissors, it was hard to see through the tears that blurred my vision. Regardless, I was resigned to the reality of my situation, so I continued chopping off my hair. I was no hairdresser, and once my long hair reached above my shoulders, I stopped. I would need a professional to tidy up the ends, otherwise my hair would look like it had lost the battle with a hacksaw. Nick? I called out as I walked toward the office he'd shown me earlier. Nick, I'm done. I peeked in his office, but it was empty, and when I heard male voices coming from another part of the house, I headed that way. Nick's house was large, and I hadn't seen most of it yet, but the voices became clearer as I drew closer. In an uproar, a man was saying. Not wanting to interrupt, I called out, Nick? In here, Morgan. I walked into the room, a spacious area with a couch and a pair of recliners, and froze. A uniformed enforcer sat on the couch, his elbows resting on his knees. An enforcer is sitting in Nick's house, I thought. Is he here to take me away? How did he find me already? And why is Nick so calm? Out of habit, I reached toward my hair to push it over my shoulder, but all I found was air. Instead, I ran my hand through my shortened hair and took a step back, instinctively wanting to flee. Morgan? You remember Josh Mills? Chapter 7 Enforcer Mills, I thought. The very sight of the man made me want to recoil, but Nick had assured me that Mills worked for him, for the resistance. That made him safe. Mills stood and faced me. How are you? I took a closer look at the man and catalogued his appearance. Mid-twenties, thick blonde hair, green eyes, broad shoulders. I'm okay. I'm sorry about the way I had to take you down. He seemed embarrassed. How was I supposed to respond? All I knew was what Nick had told me. Mills had sedated DM when he'd caught her after she'd escaped from Holly. I nodded then realized he was the first person besides Nick to see me, and he obviously assumed I was Duplicate Morgan. "'Join us,' Nick said, gesturing to an empty chair. I sat, as did Mills. "'Josh was just telling me that Holly and her group are in an uproar about your escape and disappearance.' Nick grinned. "'I guess they hadn't expected you to get away.' "'My escape. It was time to start playing my part. "'What did Holly say?' It felt strange to talk about someone I'd never met, but who I knew was important to know about and not to underestimate. Mills smiled. She's downplaying the way you snatched the controller out of her hand, of course. She knows it makes her look bad. Nick glanced at me before turning to Mills. Did you see Morgan take it from her? No, he said. We'd spotted Bryn by then and I was making my way toward her. Mills glanced at me, then met Nick's gaze. When Holly yelled at me to pursue Morgan, I have to say I was pretty surprised she'd gotten away. He turned to me. I almost lost you when you went into that neighborhood, but then I saw you going into that backyard. He shook his head. When I pulled you off of the fence, you fought hard. I saw a scratch on his cheek. Had DM caused it? Good for her, I thought. She hadn't known Mills was one of the good guys, and I was sure she'd been terrified. Then you called us, Nick supplied, and we came and got you and Morgan. That's right, Mills said. Then he glanced around. Where's Billy? My eyes went to Nick, who shifted in his seat. Ah, uh, he's taking care of some things for me. I wanted to tell him and you something, Mills said to Nick. Enforcer Hansen seems to be missing. Missing? Nick echoed. Yeah, he checked in this morning like usual, but no one's seen or heard from him since, and he's not answering a cell. Mills paused. I'm only telling you because Billy told me he'd had some less than pleasant interactions with Hanson, so I thought he would be interested. I'll pass it along, Nick said. Hanson was missing. What was that all about? Fear crept up my spine as I pictured the face of the enforcer DM had warned me about. 
Had he gone rogue? Was he searching for me right that minute? Had he followed Mills here? The hair stood up on my arms as I imagined him bursting into Nick's house and dragging me away. Are you sure no one followed you here? I heard myself asking Mills. His gaze shot to me, then his eyes narrowed. I know what I'm doing. I'll take that as a yes, I thought. Why don't you wait for me in the living room, Morgan? Nick said. I need to discuss some things with Josh. Obviously dismissed, I nodded, then left the room. Forty minutes later, Nick joined me in the living room. You did a decent job on your hair, he said. About that, I think I need someone who actually knows what they're doing to finish it up. He laughed. Yeah, it looks pretty ragged. I'll call Paula and ask her to come back. She dyed Morgan's hair to its natural color yesterday. He frowned. I'm sure she'll wonder why your hair looks different from yesterday, but she knows not to ask questions. Thanks. Nick was quiet. You know, Morgan, I'm taking a big chance on you. What do you mean? I asked. It felt like I was the one taking all the chances. After all, the enforcers are after me. I've only known you for a few hours, yet you've learned a lot of confidential information since you've been here. He rubbed the back of his neck. I hope I'm not making the wrong assumptions about where your loyalties lie. What he said was true. For all he knew, I completely agreed with the government and the grip they had on society, and I would tell them everything about Nick and his resistance group the moment I left his house, including that Mills was on the side of the resistance. No, I said. You're not making any wrong assumptions. At least I didn't think he was. Never before had I been faced with choosing sides. All my life I'd followed the rules the government had put into place, never questioning them or objecting to them. That's just how it was. When Dad had been taken to a fat center, I'd felt bad, and I'd known I would miss him, but I'd also known that there was nothing any of us could do about it. But now there seemed to be another option. Fight the rules. Work to change them. A smile slowly grew on my mouth. I, Morgan Campbell, a girl who had never done anything significant, could play a pivotal role in changing everything. What did you and Mills talk about? I asked. Hmm, Nick murmured. Then he smiled. Nothing that involves you. He didn't completely trust me yet. I got that. What about me? I asked. What happens with me now? I'll see if Paula can come over right away, then I'll take you to see your family. My family, I thought. I hadn't seen Dad in weeks, and after witnessing Amy's actions on the video, I was eager to see her too. And Mom, and my brothers, Zack and Brandon, even Goldie, our sweet dog. I hoped I would be able to see her too. Chapter 8 It didn't take long for Paula to even out my hair. And like Nick predicted, she didn't ask questions. Instead, we chatted about other things. And when she was done, and Nick had approved my look, he told me it was time to go see my family. With a hat pulled low on my head, and the tinted windows on the car, I felt invisible as we drove for over an hour to a house I'd never seen before. "'What is this place?' I asked as he pulled into the garage. "'This is a safe house.' This is where your family will be living for now. Safe from what? I asked. I thought the enforcers were after me. Is my family in danger because of me? I mean, you know, that other girl? Somehow, I hadn't quite understood the ripple effect that DM had set off. Don't forget that they took Amy in your stead. We had to assume your family was in danger. Not only that, but Morgan requested that I take them somewhere safe. Oh, as glad as I was that she'd put my family's safety at the top of her priority list, it didn't change the fact that they were only in danger because of her. Will I be living here? I asked. Your family will be safer if you're not around them, at least for now. Having me around would put them in danger? That was a sobering thought. While we shoot the videos, it will be better if you're at my place. Once we've completed those, we can discuss what to do next. I didn't like the way my future felt so uncertain. By the way, Morgan came here to visit your family two days ago, so it's not like it's the first time they've seen you since you escaped from the fat center. I nodded, then we climbed out of the car and went into the house. The garage brought us into a hallway that led to the bedrooms. Mr. and Mrs. Campbell, Nick called out as he led us away from the bedrooms. We're in here, Dad said. 
When I heard his voice, I rushed past Nick and into the family room, completely forgetting that I'd seen him just two days before. Dad! I cried as I flung myself into his arms. Hi, Morgan, he said as he pulled me against him. When I leaned away to look at him, I remembered to pretend that this wasn't the first time I'd seen him since he'd been released from whatever fat center he'd been in. I could tell he'd lost weight, but he looked tired. Was that from worrying about me? Although I had nothing to do with the situation we found ourselves in, as far as he and Mom knew, it was completely because of me. Anger at DM sliced through me, but I shoved it down. Morgan, Mom said as she opened her arms. I hurried to her and relished the warmth of her embrace. Everything felt so strange, so surreal. The last time I'd seen my family, I'd been about to spend a few days at Rochelle's cabin. So much had happened to them, yet for me only a few days had passed since I'd seen them. You seem stressed, honey, Mom said as she looked at my face. You would be too, I thought, if you'd recently discovered that another version of you has been impersonating you and screwing up your life, and now you have to deal with a fallout. Hysterical laughter began to climb my throat, but I choked it down. Hi, Morgan, a voice said beside me. I turned to my 13-year-old sister and looked at her with new eyes. Was it my imagination, or did she seem older, more mature? Hey, Amy. We all chatted for a few minutes, then Dad turned to Nick. We need to talk about the future. Sure, Nick said. I understand. Dad, Mom, and Nick sat on the couch, then Nick turned to me. Why don't you spend some time with your sister and brothers while I talk to your parents? Obviously, he wanted to talk to Mom and Dad privately. Show me your rooms, I said to 10-year-old Zach and 8-year-old Brandon. They eagerly agreed, and Amy and I followed them down the hall. He wants to talk to Mom and Dad, doesn't he? Amy asked. I glanced at my sister, a girl who had experienced things I could only imagine, and said, Yeah. I have to share a room with Zach, Brandon said, as we stopped in a room with bunk beds. But that's okay. I'm used to it. I smiled at my brother, happy to see he didn't seem upset about staying in a strange house. Goldie came running toward me. I knelt to give her a big hug, glad to know she was here with my family. Are you going to stay with us? Amy asked. Not yet. Nick has some stuff he wants me to help him with. Like what? I stood and faced her. He wants me to make some videos telling what happened. I felt like such a fraud, but Amy just nodded. I hope you can come visit us at least, she said. Me too. As I appraised my sister, a feeling of love and admiration surged through me. Thank you, I said. Then I reached out and hugged her. She returned my embrace. For what? I pulled away and smiled at her. For standing up for me at Camp Willemas. I had to get over this feeling that I was lying to everyone around me. Telling them the truth would seem like more of a lie than pretending that I was DM. You would have done the same thing for me, Amy said with confidence. But I wasn't so sure. I wasn't as brave as DM. And I never would be. Chapter 9 When it was time to go, we gathered in the living room to say goodbye. I want to go with Morgan, Amy said, her voice strong and sure. What? Dad said. I want to help. She stared at Dad like she was daring him to disagree. I want to be like Morgan. I want to tell people what happened to me. How I hadn't even done anything wrong, but they still took me to a fat center. Dad shifted his eyes to Nick. Nick nodded. Then Dad met Amy's gaze. Are you sure about this? Yes. Resolve filled her voice. I didn't say anything, but I hoped Dad would allow her to come with us. It would be wonderful to have her at Nick's with me. Can I talk to you? Dad asked Nick. Of course, Nick said. Then he, Dad, and Mom went into the kitchen. Ten minutes later, they came back into the living room. Dad looked at Amy. You can go. Amy smiled, but she didn't jump up and down like she'd won anything. She really had changed. But on one condition, Dad added. What? You follow Nick's instructions at all times, got it? Amy glanced at Nick, then nodded. You'll stay in this room with me, I told Amy, once we got back to Nick's place. Which bed do you want me to use? she asked, 
looking between the pair of twin beds tucked against the walls. I could tell which one DM had used, because even though she'd made the bed, it wasn't as neat as the other one. That one, I said, pointing to the bed that hadn't been used. Amy plopped onto the bed. I'm so tired. Sudden exhaustion crashed over me. It had been a very long day. Me too. I sat on my bed and faced Amy, trying to imagine how she must have felt when the enforcers had taken her from home and brought her to Camp Willemas, especially when she'd been completely innocent, all because of D.M., but to Amy, it was all because of me. Did she feel any lingering resentment? What's it like being here? she asked. I'd only been there one day, but I doubt a duplicate Morgan's experience would have been much different from mine. It's been fine. Nick's really nice. We talked a while longer, then got ready for bed. As I lay in the same bed DM had slept in the night before, a sense of connectedness grew within me. But would I ever really understand what she'd been through? The next day after breakfast, while Amy found some books to read, Nick brought me into his office to prepare for the interviews by having me watch DM's recording several times. By the fifth viewing, it was almost as if I'd been the one experiencing the horror she dealt with, and I felt more than ready to answer his questions on the record. Nick coached me on what to say, and after practicing for a while, we started recording. We did several ten-minute clips, each one with me the only person on camera, while his voice could be heard off-camera. "'My tech people will disguise my voice,' he said when we were done." Otherwise, the enforcers might be able to do a voice analysis and discover who I am. He smiled. The goal with these interviews is to have you tell your story in your own words. That's what will impact people. Of course, they weren't actually my experiences, but I hoped I'd sounded convincing. When Amy told Nick she was ready to be interviewed, he told her he wanted the focus to be on me first, and then later he'd have her tell her story to add an extra punch. That evening at dinner, it was just Amy, Nick, and me. I wondered when he would reveal other members of his group. I already knew about Mills and Paula, the hairdresser, but who else was part of this resistance? Doesn't anyone else live here? Amy asked, obviously noticing the isolation we were in. People come and go, but right now, the fewer people that know you're here, the better. So, he was more concerned for our safety than concerned that we, meaning me, would know who else was in his resistance group? I hope that was true. Soon after going to bed, I awoke to a nightmare. I'd been captured by Holly and brought back to the interrogation room I'd become so familiar with by watching the video over and over. Wearing a satisfied smile, Holly pressed the button on her controller, sending waves of agony coursing through my head and down my spine, while Mills stood by and watched. I screamed at him to help me, but he stared at me impassively. When I collapsed onto the floor, writhing in pain, he bent over me and calmly stated that he knew what he was doing. When I woke in a cold sweat, my body humming with the after-effects of the torture device, I wondered if I'd developed some sort of symbiosis with DM, or if my overactive imagination had filled in the blanks and convinced my body that I'd actually experienced the torture. Unable to shake the sensation that I was in danger, I couldn't settle down and fall asleep, and decided to get a drink of water. Amy slept soundly in the other bed, so I tiptoed out of our room and down the hall. In the dark kitchen, I turned on the light, took a glass from the cupboard, and filled it with cold water from the refrigerator dispenser. I glanced at the microwave clock. It was only eleven. I dreaded the long night ahead of me. Slowly drinking the water... I repeated like a mantra, You're safe here. Amy is safe here. You have nothing to fear here. When my glass was empty, I set it in the pristine sink, then headed toward my bedroom. But when I heard Nick's voice coming from his office, I crept down the hall until I could hear his voice more clearly. It's not that I wanted to eavesdrop, but I'd gotten the feeling that after his initial burst of trust, he was pulling back from me, taking a wait-and-see stance, I understood his reticence. After all, he had a very important operation going on here, and he wouldn't want to jeopardize it by trusting the wrong people. Maybe when Billy had first brought me to his house, and Nick had been overwhelmed by the notion of a parallel world, 
he'd temporarily forgotten that I wasn't E.M. and had told me more than he'd meant to. Of course, he'd had to get me up to speed on what D.M. had experienced. How else would he get me to do the interviews that he wanted to post online? But now that he'd gotten what he needed from me, why would he tell me anything that could potentially endanger him or his people or their plans? For my own safety, I needed to know everything I could. That feeling was brought home all the more after the horrific nightmare I'd just had, especially since a sense of helplessness lingered within me. Chapter 10 No, that hasn't changed, I heard Nick say from where I hid in the shadows of the dark hallway. Then, to my surprise, I heard a second voice, one that I recognized as Mills, but it sounded odd, and after a moment I realized he was on speakerphone. Good, Mills was saying. It's important that we stick to the primary goal. Of course, Nick said. Like I told you yesterday, once the videos reach 50,000 views, that's when we'll move into phase two. Is Morgan on board? Mills asked. Uh, I haven't talked to her about it yet, Nick said, but I'm sure she'll agree it's the best way to proceed. My heart thumped inside my chest. They were talking about me, about something they wanted me to do, something that Nick hadn't told me about yet. Why? Was he afraid I wouldn't agree to it? What was it? I'm not so sure, Mill said. She has to know it will put her and her sister in danger. He paused. How committed is she? Put us in danger, I thought. That didn't sound like anything I wanted to be involved with. Nick was quiet. I'm still determining that, which is why I haven't discussed phase two with her yet. Mills laughed softly. You might want to keep a close eye on her. It would totally screw everything up if she decided to leave before we implemented phase two. She and Amy aren't going anywhere, Nick said. They're too scared of capture. As they should be, Mills said. Holly is apoplectic with fury that Morgan got the better of her. You should have seen her in today's staff meeting. He laughed, but there was no humor in it. I thought she was going to take someone's head off. In fact, if she ever gets her hands on Morgan... His words trailed off. Look, Nick said, I'll do my best, but you know there aren't any guarantees. What was that supposed to mean? No guarantees that he could keep me safe? Any feeling of security I'd had fled in that moment. Maybe you can toss Holly a bone, Mills said. What do you mean? Morgan's useful, Mills said, for now. But her sister is like any of the thousands of other kids who have been through the system. What are you suggesting? Nick asked. If Amy is somehow found by the enforcers, that might assuage Holly's rage enough for us to accomplish our goals. Plus, that would really light a fire under Morgan. She would be all in for phase two. What were they talking about? Would Nick really hand Amy over to the enforcers? What could I do about it? Adrenaline coursed through my body, and my initial dislike for Mills turned into intense loathing. Surely Nick would dismiss Mills' suggestion without even considering it. Up until then, I'd believed that Nick had my and Amy's best interests in mind, but now I wasn't so sure. I nearly held my breath as I waited to hear what Nick would say. Look, he said, these girls trust me to keep them safe. Their parents are trusting me. When Mills didn't reply, Nick said, Besides, Holly would break her, and now she knows too much. So, his main concern wasn't Amy, but what Amy would tell Holly. Any smidgen of trust I'd had for Nick evaporated. What does Amy actually know? Mills asked. Nick was quiet. She's seen me, and she knows where I live. She also knows the location of one of the safe houses. He paused a beat. I don't know if Morgan's told her about you. Hmm, Mills said. That would be problematic. He paused. Ask Morgan if she's told Amy about me, and if she hasn't, emphasize the importance of keeping it to herself. And if she has? Nick asked. Then they're both becoming a liability. I'm not sure I agree with that, Josh. Morgan did well in the interviews we recorded, and I'm sure there's much more she can do for the cause. At some point, Mills said, you'll have to cut her loose, Nick. She's toxic, and chances are good that they'll find her eventually, 
which means they'll find you. Don't panic now, Nick said. I have things well in hand. No one knows she's here except you. Don't forget her family, Mel said. They have no idea where the house is. Don't you think they'll want to see their children from time to time? Mel said. Then what? How will you arrange that? How will you prevent them from being followed? Nick sighed. We'll cross that bridge when we come to it. You're the one in charge, Nick, but you and I both know how the enforcers operate. When her family gets tired of hiding out and they decide to go home, the enforcers will bug their phones and lowjack their cars immediately. You can count on it. In the silence that followed, my thoughts churned. How long until my family got tired of staying in the safe house? What would happen if they went home? Would that mean I would never be able to talk to them again, let alone see them? An ache began in my chest, and I tried to rub it away, but it only settled deeper into my heart. There's something else you need to know, Mills said. Something serious. Something that may involve Morgan. What is it? They found Hansen's body. His body, Nick said. He's dead? Yes. How did he die? Where did they find him? Hansen was dead? How could that possibly involve me? Wasn't his death a good thing? I closed my eyes as I concentrated on Mill's explanation. Remember that Morgan and Billy had coordinates programmed into a GPS device? Mill said. Yes. Evidently, a pair of enforcers decided to check those coordinates again today. Of course, they didn't find Morgan. All they found was a tunnel that led to a small building. They searched the area around the tunnel opening, and that's when they found Hansen's body. How did he die? Nick asked. It looks like he fell and hit his head on a rock, but due to the fact that he was in the area Morgan and Billy had pinpointed, they're blaming the two of them. What are the coordinates? I don't know, Nick. Why? Just curious. At the mention of a tunnel, my thoughts flew. That must be how Duplicate Morgan crossed over. Was there some way to get those coordinates? What would I do with them? Was I brave enough to actually try to cross into Duplicate Morgan's world? What about Amy? I couldn't leave her here to fend for herself. Nick, do you see now that Morgan's toxic? Not only did she escape Holly, but they think she murdered an enforcer. They want her head on a platter. Billy's too. Yes, Nick said. His voice resigned. Yes, I understand. The ominous tone in Mill's voice shattered my fantasies of finding the tunnel and escaping. There was no way for me to get those coordinates. What I needed to focus on was protecting myself and Amy. Billy was long gone, off to reunite with DM. It was just me, and I was ill-equipped to survive. Chapter 11 when Nick said goodbye to Mills, I scurried back to the bedroom Amy and I shared and climbed into bed. My heart drummed against my ribs as I frantically tried to construct a plan. If Duplicate Morgan was here, I thought, she would know exactly what to do, but I have no idea, and I don't know who to ask. Fear and trepidation swept over me, and I broke into a cold sweat. Throwing back the blankets, I sat up on the side of the bed then covered my face with my hands. Amy's even breathing filled the space around me, and I peered through my fingers to see her curled on her side. I was the big sister, and it was up to me to protect her. But how could I protect her when I didn't know how to protect myself? I replayed the conversation I'd overheard, and though at first I tried to persuade myself that Nick would never do anything to purposely put Amy and me in danger— the more I thought about it, the more I became convinced that he would put himself and his cause above our safety, especially when I recalled the tone of his voice after Mills had told him that I was wanted for murder. Murder? Mills had said I was toxic, and Nick had said he understood. But what did that mean? What did he understand? That he had to get as far away from me as possible? What about Amy? Mills had said she was a liability. I knew what that meant. Get rid of her. It sounded like I'd become a liability as well. What would Nick do with us? He couldn't turn us over to the enforcers. Could he? Didn't I know too much now? 
I considered what I knew. I knew Nick was leading this resistance group, and I knew that Enforcer Mills worked for the resistance, but that was all. With my non-existent sense of direction, I was certain I wouldn't be able to tell the Enforcers where Nick lived. All he would have to do is lay low, maybe move to one of his safe houses. Mills would have to go underground. Besides that, I couldn't do much damage. But what if Nick kept me around? Would he be in more danger if I stayed with him, or if he let me tell the little I knew to Holly? I didn't know, but I couldn't take a chance on finding out. Somehow, Amy and I had to get away from Nick and Mills. That would be hard enough, but the bigger challenge would be an evading capture by the army of enforcers who wanted my head on a platter. And I had no clue how to do that. I considered finding my way back to my family, but immediately knew that was a non-starter. Besides having no idea how to find them, Nick had made it clear that my presence could be a danger to them. I didn't want to put my parents and little brothers in any danger. Amy and I were on our own. I lay back on my pillow and stared at the ceiling. Moonlight trickled in through the edges of the blinds, and I watched shadows dance on the walls as the wind shook the bare branches outside my room. Soon, the weather would turn colder. I imagined Amy and me sleeping outside in the dead of winter and felt a shiver work its way through my bones. Then I pictured DM. What would she do in this situation? Maybe if I pretended to be her, I could come up with some idea of how to proceed. Taking several deep breaths, I closed my eyes and visualized the girl who I imagined was brave and fearless. An image of her and Billy sitting close together, plotting and planning, came into my mind. I could almost hear her voice in my head. First, she would say, we need to make sure we have some basic supplies. Like what? Billy would ask. It's going to be cold, so we'll need warm jackets. We'll also need food and water. Where will we sleep at night? Billy would ask. I'm not sure yet, she would say. We'll want to look for shelter, maybe an abandoned building. How will you carry your supplies? We'll need to get a backpack, she would say. I think Amy has one we can use. Billy would nod. Good idea. He would pause. What about protection? You know, in case the enforcers find you. My eyes fluttered open as my heart thundered. If the enforcers found me, I didn't know what I would do. I pictured them surrounding me and saw myself freezing, paralyzed with fear. They would capture me easily. I probably wouldn't even have the strength to fight back. Even so, I couldn't stay at Nick's. I needed to gather a few supplies, and then Amy and I would get out. Now that I'd come up with the bare bones of a plan, exhaustion settled over me like a weighted blanket. My eyes grew heavy, and I fell into a deep sleep awoke to Amy gently shaking me. Morgan, she said, breakfast is ready. Wake up. Groggy, it took me a moment to remember where I was, but when I recalled that Amy and I were in danger, all sleepiness fled. What time is it? I think it's eight o'clock, she said. Nick knocked on the door and said he made us breakfast. Amy was already dressed. After overhearing Nick's conversation with Mills the night before, I worried about facing him. Would I be able to hide my newly obtained information? Information that he most likely had no intention of sharing with me. Would he be able to tell that any trust I developed toward him had been shattered? What would he do if he was able to tell? Would he send for Mills and have him take both Amy and me to Holly? The idea sent a shiver of terror rolling up my spine until the hairs on the back of my neck stood straight up. Come on, Morgan, I'm hungry. Okay. Squelching my panic, I threw back the covers and dug around in the clothes DM had left behind until I found a pair of jeans and a sweater. Then I carried them to the bathroom and got dressed. Her clothes were a little big on me, but they worked well enough. Chapter 12 Good morning, Nick said with a smile when Amy and I walked into the kitchen. Good morning! Amy replied, as cheerful as I'd seen her. I smiled tightly and slid into a chair at the table. How did you girl sleep? Nick asked. Great, Amy said. I nodded in agreement. 
Yeah, I slept fine. That was a total and complete lie, but the truth would be dangerous to share. Good, good. Nick placed a plate of fresh fruit on the table, along with whole wheat toast, poached eggs, and orange juice. Eat up. We have a busy morning planned. My gaze shot to his face. I thought we were done with the interviews. His smile never wavered. We are, but there are some other things I need to discuss with you. Not sure if I wanted to hear whatever it was he wanted to discuss, I said. What about Amy? For now, this will be between you and me. I glanced at Amy, who seemed focused on eating her breakfast, then looked at Nick. Okay. If he was going to talk to me privately, maybe that meant he still considered me an asset rather than a liability. After we finished eating, I offered to clean up the breakfast dishes. Amy helped me while Nick went into his office. I like it here, Amy said, as she loaded dishes into the dishwasher. You haven't been here very long, I said. How willing would she be to leave if she was already feeling comfortable? Would she believe me if I told her she was in danger? Would she even trust me to take care of her? Could I take care of her? I had serious doubts that I could take care of myself, let alone someone else. I know, she said, but I feel safe here. She studied me. Don't you? I mean, you seem to trust Nick. Uh, was this the right time to tell her I wanted to leave? How much time did I have before we were in real danger? How much time would I have to gather supplies? Where would I get the supplies? I studied my sister's face. She was the only person I could trust. I knew that. I had to tell her my concerns. About done? Nick said as he walked into the kitchen. I jerked around. I hadn't heard him approach. Yep, Amy said. Can I read while you and Morgan talk? Sure. He smiled at Amy. Can you finish up in here while Morgan and I get started? Sudden panic swept over me. Was he trying to separate us so that Mills could grab Amy and take her to Holly? I think Amy should come with us, I blurted. Nick narrowed his eyes. I need to talk to you privately. It's okay, Amy said, her face open and trusting. I want to read anyway. Adrenaline thrummed through my veins. How could I argue with them without giving away my concerns? The Morgan of yesterday would be more than happy to let Amy sit by herself and read. Fearful, yet trying to convince myself I was overreacting, I nodded. Great, Nick said. Then he motioned with his hand. Let's meet in my office. I'll be right there, I said to Nick, wanting a chance to give Amy some kind of warning. Nick nodded, then left the kitchen. The moment he cleared the room, I turned to Amy and in a frantic whisper I said, If you see anyone, anyone at all, call out to me, okay? She must have seen the terror on my face, because her eyes widened in fright. What's going on, Morgan? I didn't want her to panic. I just wanted her to be aware. I'm not completely sure yet, but we have to be careful. You know something, she said. I can tell. After I meet with Nick, we'll talk. Her expression became serious in a way I'd never seen before, and I knew it was due to her time at Camp Willemas. Okay. Remember, I said, call out to me if you see anyone. She nodded, but all appearance of happiness had fled. I found Nick in his office, sitting in front of his computer monitor. When he saw me, he motioned for me to sit across from him. Are very many people watching the interviews we did? When I'd overheard him, he'd said the magic number of views was 50,000. The original video Morgan did has hit over a million views, but the interviews are just getting started. They're all around 5,000 this morning. Optimism lit his face. But I'll bet within a few days they'll go viral too. That meant I had a couple of days, at most. What did you want to talk to me about? First of all, I wanted to ask you if you've discussed Mills with Amy. I calculated my answer. If I told him yes, would that protect Amy? Or would that make both of us liabilities, as Mills had said? If I told him no, then Amy would truly be expendable. I can't remember, I said. I may have said something. Why? Let's see what he does with that, I thought. Irritation clouded his eyes. Please remember, Morgan, that knowing about Mills is very sensitive information. It's critical that you keep that to yourself, understand? I nodded. 
Yes. I had no idea if I'd helped or hurt Amy and myself, but it was the best I'd been able to come up with. Now, Nick said, as he leaned back in his chair, let's talk about the future. This is why I'd come into his office. Maybe he would tell me about phase two, whatever that was. Maybe I would even like his plan. Deep inside, okay, maybe not that deep, I wanted nothing more than to stay at Nick's where I wouldn't have to figure out how to survive. He would take care of everything. He would keep Amy and me safe, and I wouldn't have to worry about a thing. Realistically, I knew that was a fantasy, but it was a fantasy I clung to nevertheless. I want to emphasize again, Morgan, that whatever we discuss needs to remain between the two of us. His eyes narrowed. To be safe, don't even talk about this with your sister. What do you mean, I said, to be safe? His face relaxed. I mean, you never know what is or isn't okay to share, so it's best not to share anything. That way you won't tell her something she shouldn't know. That made sense, although if he was so worried about me spilling secrets, why would he tell them to me in the first place? Very soon, he began, I have something that I'm going to need your help with. This was it. Phase two. My stomach roiled as I waited to hear what he had in mind. Chapter 13 I'll need you to create a distraction. Nick smiled. A distraction that uses enforcer resources. I don't understand. The idea is to get the attention of a large number of enforcers on you and keep them focused on you for a certain period of time. I didn't like the sound of that. I didn't want any enforcer's attention on me, ever. When an image of dozens, maybe even hundreds, of enforcers closing in on me flooded my mind, nausea climbed my throat and I thought I would vomit. Swallowing convulsively, I got the nausea under control, but then my head swam as a bout of dizziness overcame me. I wanted to appear strong, but I bent my head and closed my eyes until the wave of dizziness passed. Are you okay, Morgan? Nick asked. No, I wanted to scream. How can I be okay when you're asking me to expose myself to capture? Just give me a minute, I said. Of course. He waited while I gathered myself, and when I sat up and faced him, he said, I know this is scary, but we'll do everything we can to keep you out of the hands of the enforcers. Yeah, right, I thought. You're not the one whose head they want on a platter for murdering an enforcer. As the magnitude of my circumstances battered against my brain, a fresh wave of nausea hit me, and this time I couldn't stop my breakfast from coming up. I rushed out of Nick's office and made it to the bathroom just in time. Are you okay? Amy asked from the other side of the door a few minutes later. Ignoring her, I retched until there was nothing left. Then I went to the sink, rinsed out my mouth, and stared at myself in the mirror. The blood had drained from my face. Even my lips were pale. I splashed several handfuls of cold water over my cheeks, then used a soft towel to dry my face. Morgan? Amy asked. I opened the door and met the eyes of my younger sister. I heard you run down the hall, she said and then it sounded like you were throwing up. Are you okay? Taking a deep breath, I closed my eyes and shook my head. What's wrong? I opened my eyes and felt tears forming. This was too much. It was all just too much. The parallel world, duplicate Morgan, everyone believing I'd been the one locked up, enforcers after me for murder, and now Nick wanted me to cause a distraction that would make lots of enforcers take notice of me. No, I was definitely not all right. Tell me, Amy pressed. I wanted to tell her everything, but I had to get more information first. There was no reason to frighten her before I had all the facts. I will, I said, as I got my tears under control. I promise, Amy, but I need to finish talking to Nick first. I appraised her. What about you? Are you okay? She smiled. Yeah, I'm fine. Leaning toward me, she whispered, You'd better tell me what's going on. I will, I murmured. She turned and walked to the living room, and I went to Nick's office and sat in the chair I'd been in before. He stopped typing on his keyboard and smiled at me. I hope you're feeling better. I'm sure this is difficult for you. 
That was an understatement, but I nodded. As I was about to tell you, several members of our team will be near you at all times, ready to come to your defense if necessary. That was something, at least. What would I be doing exactly? He leaned back in his chair. We're going to call a news conference where you'll answer questions directly from the media. We'll make a big deal about the fact that you'll be answering questions live. He smiled. But you're not actually going to show up at that location in person. He chuckled. No one will know that until the time of the news conference, and by then everyone will be assembled, so they'll still want to talk to you. I sat up straighter. That didn't sound quite so terrifying. Where will I be? At a location a few miles away. We'll use a remote system for you to talk to the media. That way they can still talk to you live, but you'll be out of the reach of the enforcers. His plan didn't actually sound so bad. There's a catch, though, he said. Of course there was. What is it? Because of the signal we'll be using to broadcast your remarks, eventually the enforcers will be able to pinpoint your location. Now that sounded terrifying. How long will it take them? That's the unknown variable in this equation. We believe we'll have 15 minutes, but we can't be sure. He cleared his throat. We're not certain what technology they have at this point. That wasn't good enough for me. Way too risky. The point of all of this is still kind of fuzzy to me, I said. If you want the media to talk to me, why not just do it over the phone or something? Wouldn't that be safer? Like I said in the beginning, you would be a distraction. From what? From other goals that we have. Why would I agree to something so risky without knowing the real reason? I was sure Duplicate Morgan would never do that. Knowing that bolstered my insistence. I want to know more, Nick. I want to know the whole plan. With a look of indulgence, he said, That part of the plan is strictly on a need-to-know basis, Morgan. I've told you the part you would play. That's all you need to know. I'm not going to do it, I thought. The statement came into my mind so strongly that I didn't question it. But somehow, I knew I shouldn't share it with Nick not after overhearing his conversation the night before. Instead, I decided to push for more information. Besides wanting to know what I was being asked to risk myself for, I was curious what he and Mills had planned. If you trust me enough to play this game, I said, then you should trust me enough to tell me the whole plan. He stared at me, and for a moment I thought he might actually tell me. Then he shook his head. I'm sorry, Morgan. I'm not at liberty to divulge that part of the plan. Holding back a frown, I nodded. Okay. If he wouldn't tell me the whole plan, he could at least tell me more about my part. How will you know when the enforcers have figured out where I am? We'll confiscate a radio and listen to their chatter. That didn't reassure me. I pretended to be DM while I looked for all the holes in his plan. So, if you don't get your hands on a radio, then you won't have a way to know? We're confident we'll be able to get a radio, but in the small chance that we don't, we'll have people stationed among the media keeping an eye on the enforcers. It will be pretty clear when they've triangulated your location. What if enforcers happen to be near my location when they figure out where I am? I won't have time to get away. I surprised myself with my clarity of thought, but knowing I had no intention of actually doing what Nick was asking calmed me. That's why we'll have people around you to protect you. It's highly unlikely that more than a couple of enforcers would be in the area that soon. If they show up, we'll dispatch them and get you out of there. I wasn't sure what he meant by dispatch them, but it didn't sound like it would endear me to the enforcers. What do you think? Nick asked. I had to make him believe I was considering it. How else to sneak away without giving him a clue? I guess it could work. He smiled. So, you're willing to participate? To be the star, actually. When will this be? I asked. I didn't want to agree to something that could happen in the next couple of days. I needed time to gather supplies first. We'll want to talk it up for a few days, so late next week. What about you? I asked. Will you be there with me? I mean, in case someone asks a question I don't know the answer to. We'll practice ahead of time so that you'll be ready for any question. But will you be there? No, I have a different part to play. 
Why didn't that surprise me? Does that matter to you? If I was actually going to do it, I would want to know he was risking just as much as me. Kind of, yeah. I'll see what I can do, but no promises. He smiled like he was trying to reassure me, but I didn't buy it. What about Amy? I asked. Where will she be during the news conference? She would be here, safe. After hearing Mill's eagerness to toss Amy into Holly's hands, I wasn't sure how safe she would be here, especially if I wasn't here with her. It didn't matter. Amy and I would be gone by then. All right. Can I count on you, Morgan? Putting a look of confidence on my face, I nodded. Yes. His smile grew. I knew you were just like her. Did that mean DM would have agreed to do it? Did that mean I should do it? Chapter 14 Are you going to tell me what's going on now? Amy asked as I pulled her into our bedroom. Yes. I shut the door, then tugged her down to sit beside me on the bed. Wishing we were back in the room we shared in Timber Hills, I sighed, then told her everything. What I'd overheard the night before, what Nick wanted me to do, and what Mill's part was in all of this. I didn't say a word about Duplicate Morgan. I don't want them to take me to Holly, she said. Her voice was frantic with worry. I saw the video, Morgan. I can't do what you did, okay? I just can't. Tears sprang into her eyes. You know how awful it was at Camp Willamas, the way everyone treated me like I had a disease or something. I can't do that again. And I know I couldn't stand the torture you did. I could never be like you. I shifted uncomfortably under the adulation I read in her face. I could never be like D.M. either. I would crack at the mere suggestion of torture. Hating that I couldn't tell Amy the truth, I tried to brush aside her worries. I'm not going to let anything happen to you, Amy. I felt like I was playing a part. The part of Duplicate Morgan, a girl who had courage. In all reality, I had no idea how to keep my sister safe. Amy slid an arm around my waist and put her head on my shoulder. Thank you. Not wanting to consider all the ways I would most certainly fail Amy, I focused on what we could do now. We need to get supplies. She looked at me, her eyebrows pulled together. Supplies? For what? Her eyes widened. Are we leaving? Don't you think we should? Was I wrong to think that was the way to proceed? Amy had more experience than I did. I would listen to her advice. What about going back to Mom and Dad? She asked. I thought about that, but Nick would find us there. Where can we go then? She asked, then looked thoughtful. Where were you all that time after you escaped Camp Willowmoss, before you came back as Hannah? I am so out of my league, I thought. D.M. hadn't said anything in her letter about that, and Billy was gone. I had no one to help me fill in the blanks. I knew from Duplicate Morgan's interrogation that she'd been with people named Jack and Danny, and that a girl named Bryn had helped her, but I didn't have the first clue about how to find those people. Uh, we can't go there, I said, avoiding Amy's question. We'll have to figure something else out. Okay. Her trust in me was so complete, so transparent. Would she hate me when my incompetence got us both captured? What kind of supplies do we need? She asked. Food and water and warm coats. That was all I'd come up with on my own. Can you think of anything else we might need? I guess it depends on where we stay, she said. Like, should we have a tent or will we be in a building? Having someone to bounce ideas off of really helped. I don't know if we can get our hands on a tent, I said. So we should definitely try to find a building or something. Okay, she looked thoughtful. We should get matches or a lighter in case we need to build a fire to stay warm. Good idea. Why hadn't I thought of that? What else, Amy? What about a flashlight in case we have to find our way in the dark? I smiled at her. You're really good at this. Blushing, she said, you already knew we needed those things, didn't you? You're just trying to help me figure it out. If only, I thought. Hiding my utter incompetence, I laughed. Can you think of anything else? Her face lit up. Oh, what about a map? You know, of this area, so we can keep track of where we are. 
Those were three important things she'd thought of that had never occurred to me. We're going to get captured for sure. Despair swept over me, but I kept a smile on my face. Yes, right. That's all I can think of, she said with a frown. What about you? Is there anything else? I hope not, I thought. I don't think so, but we'll need to use your backpack to carry everything in. Okay. We'll have to take everything from Nick, I said. Inwardly, I cringed. I'd never stolen anything before, but we had nowhere else to turn. I know, she said. Then her forehead creased. When should we leave? That was the big question, though I wished the whole issue would just go away and that we could either go home to our family or at least stay safe at Nick's. Eventually, we would have to walk out the door of this house and find somewhere else to stay, but I wanted to put it off as long as I could. We should leave before I have to go to the news conference, so uh, I guess when Nick starts announcing it, we'll know it's time to go. Amy considered this. But what if someone comes and gets me before that? Shouldn't we leave right away, just in case? She stared at me, her face paling. We can't be here if someone comes for me, Morgan. No, of course not. Her voice rose in pitch. I mean, what if they sneak in here while we're sleeping? We'll be totally unprepared. Her growing hysteria was contagious, and a shiver of dread tickled my neck. A knock on the door startled us both, and Amy let out a small scream. Morgan? Nick said from outside the door. Amy? I'll talk to him, I whispered. Then I went to the door and opened it. Trying to keep my expression calm, I smiled. Hi. He seemed distracted. I have some things to take care of, so I'm going to leave the two of you alone. Will you be okay? Unnerved at his unexpected announcement, I pushed a pretended look of confidence on my face. Yeah, of course. Good, good. Make sure to stay in the house and don't open the door to anyone. That sounded ominous. He must have read the concern on my face because he laughed. I'm not expecting anyone, and you're probably smart enough to know not to open the door to strangers. But, you know, I thought I should mention it. He smiled. Besides, the alarm will be set, so you should be fine. Right. Even though his words seemed reassuring, skepticism crawled through my brain. Did Mills have the alarm code, I wondered? Okay, I'll see you in a while. I watched him walk away, then I turned to Amy. This is our chance. Chance to what? she asked. To get our supplies. Okay. She stood. Let's wait a minute, you know, to make sure he's gone. Chapter 15 Several minutes later, we made our way out of our room and toward the garage door. All was silent. I pressed my ear to the garage door but didn't open it. I didn't want to set off the alarm. I heard nothing. I think the coast is clear, I said. A moment later, we stood in the middle of the kitchen. I'll look for food we can bring, I said. You look for matches and water. Okay. I pulled open the pantry and saw plenty of food and began taking out items that I thought we would want to have. Then I rearranged the pantry so it wasn't obvious anything had been taken. Glancing at Amy, I saw that she'd found a stash of water bottles and she'd put half a dozen onto the counter. How many should we bring? she asked. We don't want the backpack to be too heavy. Plus, we'll need room for other stuff, so maybe just those? Hopefully we'll find a place where we can refill them. All right. She turned back to the cupboard. I'll see if I can find matches. Twenty minutes later, we'd put the food, water, and matches into her backpack and then made sure the kitchen looked just as we'd found it. Now we need a flashlight, map, and warm coats, Amy said, as we stashed the backpack in the closet of our bedroom. On edge, and worried that Nick would return at any moment, I nodded. Where should we look? she asked. I'll check his office. But the moment the offer left my lips, my heart began to race. What if he caught me in there? What would he do? Okay, she said. I'll look in the other rooms. I didn't like the idea of Amy getting caught where she shouldn't be either, but our search area was limited. Not knowing how much time we had until Nick would return, urgency pushed me out of the kitchen and toward Nick's office. After a moment, I stood in the doorway, then I went to the bookshelf and quickly perused the non-book items to see if he had any maps stashed on the shelves. 
I didn't see any and moved to the desk. Pulling each drawer open, I rummaged through them but found nothing we would need. Sighing, I stood in the middle of the room and slowly turned in a circle. No maps, no flashlights, and certainly no warm coats. What are you doing in here? Nick asked from the doorway. I spun toward him and my face blazed red. He had almost caught me going through his desk. I, uh, I was just looking for something to write on, you know, so I could write a letter to my parents. Oh, he frowned. Did he buy my excuse? Let me get you some paper. He walked into the room, slid open a drawer I'd been rifling through moments before, and withdrew a notepad. Here you go. He held it out to me. Let me get you a pen. My mind was stuck on the question of how I hadn't heard him coming, but then I realized that the door from the garage to the kitchen wasn't exactly close by. Thanks. He gave me a pen, then smiled. Give me your letter when you're done, and I'll see about getting it to them. I nodded. Maybe Amy could write them a letter as well. Yeah, she wanted to, I said, assuming it was true. Morgan, Amy shouted from down the hallway, her voice showing that she was approaching the office. I found a... She stopped in the doorway, her hand wrapped around a flashlight. Oh. We can write letters to Mom and Dad now, I said, as I held up the paper and pen. Oh, good, she said, without missing a beat. What do you need a flashlight for? Nick asked, his brow wrinkling. Amy's been feeling a little scared at night, I said, but she didn't want to turn on the overhead light and bother me. I see. Nick rubbed his chin. I can put a table lamp beside her bed. That would be more efficient. Thanks, Amy said with a bright smile, as if he'd just solved her biggest problem. He held out his hand. I'll take the flashlight. With a jerk, she put it behind her back. I'd like to keep it. A look of terror filled her eyes, and I knew it wasn't completely pretend. I get nightmares, and it would make me feel better. Nick smiled. In that case, I suppose it would be fine. Thank you, she said. We all stood there. I have some work to do, Nick said. Make sure to give me your letters when you're done. We will, I said, eager to leave. A moment later, Amy and I closed the door to our room. What were you doing when he showed up? Amy whispered just standing in the middle of the room trying to figure out where to look next. Wow, you got so lucky. I know, I whispered. I almost wet myself when he caught me in there. Now that would be embarrassing, she said. We both laughed softly until our hearts had settled into a normal rhythm. Then we sat side by side on my bed. Where did you find the flashlight? I asked. In one of the other bedrooms. It was on a shelf in the closet. Her hands twisted around the flashlight. I almost blew it, didn't I? It's not your fault. I meant that. Neither one of us had heard Nick return, but we would have to be more careful in the future. Maybe next time, she said, one of us will have to be a lookout or something. Yeah, but when will our next chance be? She shrugged. I guess we can get by without a map, but we'll definitely need warm coats. Urgency to leave swelled within me. My voice fell to a whisper. I just want to get out of here. Maybe we can go tonight, she said. What about the alarm, Amy? Nick said he always turns it on at night, and I don't know the code. A knock at the door interrupted us. I have your lamp, Nick said through the door. Amy opened it, and he walked in. Then he placed a small lamp on the nightstand beside Amy's bed and plugged it in. There you go. Thank you, she said. That will help a lot. He nodded, then left. That was fast, Amy said, as she closed the door, then sat beside me. We'd better write our letters to Mom and Dad, I said. Otherwise, he'll get suspicious. Amy nodded. I want to anyway. Thinking about my parents made me miss them. Me too. Half an hour later, we'd both finished composing our letters. We had to assume that Nick would read our letters before passing them on, so neither one of us had written anything he would disapprove of. We folded them into thirds and set them on the dresser. We can give them to him later, I said. Though tempted to creep down the hall to his office to see if I could overhear something important, I didn't want to do anything that would make him suspect I knew what he and Mills had discussed the night before. Still, I knew it was important to discover whatever I could, for Amy's safety as well as my own. 
This has been Dare to Prevail, Part 1, Parallel World, Book 5, written and narrated by Christine Kersey. Copyright 2014 by Christine Kersey. The Other Morgan Story continues in Dare to Prevail, Part 2.